Good morning. Everybody doing good? Everybody looks good. Well, look, it's a little different up here again. They, we, we got our instruments kind of moved around because we've been getting this finished up. It looks good, right? Everybody say, hey, if it looks good. Okay, good. Good job. Just, just making sure because I, I was kind of lost there. I didn't say yeah. But anyway, look, we're fixing to get started. I'm fixing to open it with prayer, and then they'll get it kicked off. Dear God, thank you for giving us this chance to be in your house to worship you, Lord. Thank you for blessing the musicians with the ability to be able to bring this worship to us, God. Thank you for the word that you gave the, the speaker for us, God. I pray that our ears are open to receive it the way that you have us. In Jesus' name, amen.
And you know what? There's an army rising up. Oh yes, there's an army and it's rising up. There's an army rising up to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Sing it again. There's an army rising up. Are you part of it? There's an army and it's rising up. It's rising up to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain.
addiction here this morning that he wants to break. There's chains of depression here this morning that he wants to break. He's here to break every chain, every chain of poverty. Give it to him this morning, children. Give it to him now. He'll break every chain this morning. take lightly or for granted the, the moving of the spirit like you're experiencing now some of you are bound and some of you become so used to this grew up in this you've hardened your heart and I need to tell you that if you're going to go further in God you're going to have to let God begin to move freely in your life again some of you, you, you you've got to want those chains to be broken some of you, you're enjoying that season of sin. And I'm going to pray now that God just makes you sick to it. Because I, I've seen the end road of sin is death. And the wages of sin is death. And I need to tell you that if you give your heart to the Lord today, it'll, it'll, it'll change your life. But some of you, you've been enjoying it. And you say, well, I'm not ready to become a Christian. I want to live. I want to live. I want to live. Listen to me. There's only one life to live and that's for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're here and you say, Pastor, I've got sin in my life. I've got to make some changes in my life. And I'm talking to you. You feel it. You know the Spirit of the Lord is touching you. You recognize it. And Satan is whispering in your ear. Hold on. Hold on. You can survive this one. You can get through this service. But I'm here to tell you God's got a purpose and a plan for your life. But you've got to turn from that sin. And you've got to turn back to God. You're here. You say, preacher, you're talking to me. I'm not going to ask you to duck your head. I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes. But if you really want the will of God in your life, and you're tired of change, fighting, alcohol, dope, nicotine, cussing, worry, stress, financial poverty. You're sick of it. I want you to lift your hand up and say, I've got to make some changes in my life. Come on, I want you. Come on. Come right up here. Sister Ginger, come on. Hallelujah. I got two ladies. They're going to they get some things straight today. Anybody else? Come on. You're going you're gonna to have to make some changes today. I'm telling you, just as I'm standing here, the Spirit of the Lord is moving. This isn't in every church either. This isn't in every church either. 
But listen to me. You've got to make some changes. You've got to come away from that thing. You've got to die to that sin and come alive in Christ. Anybody else? Pastor, you're talking to me. I've got to make some changes in my life. Come on, you've got a mean business. I'm not going to beg you. I'm not going to plead with you. If you mean business with God, he'll, he'll keep breaking those chains. Come on, Butch, right there. Melanie, come on. Please. Come on. Anyone else? I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about relationship. I'm talking about God doing such a work in you. You're miserable if you're not pleasing Him. Amen. Everyone else who wants to go in a deeper walk with their Lord, your Savior, lift your hand toward heaven and begin to cry out for more, more of Him. Come on, lift your voice up if you want more of Him. Lift your voice up and say, God, I want more of you. More of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. More of you, more of you, more of you and less of me. I want more of you. If I fill my life with you, God, then chains are broken. My life gets restored. In the name of Jesus, I come against every chain, every chain of addiction, every spirit that is holding back the children of God. I curse it in Jesus' name, and I declare by the name and the authority of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, every devil's got to run. Every devil has to flee. We resist you, Satan. Now flee in Jesus' name. Jesus is Lord of this house. Jesus is master of this house. The Holy Spirit is in control of this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every pain, every hurt, every spirit of oppression, every spirit of depression, it has to go in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. More of you, God, if that's your cry, come on. Join me one more time. Lift your hand up. Everybody that will just want more of God. Some of you are thinking, if this is real, God, reveal yourself. He's doing it in a service right now. He's making himself known. Come on, recognize him. Submit to him. Submit to the tugging of the Holy Spirit. Submit to the tugging of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I want more of you. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. There's power in the name of Jesus. Come on, worship him. His power in the name of Jesus. His power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain.
You're worthy, you're worthy of all my praise. You are worthy, worthy of all glory, power, and praise. Lord Jesus is worthy, he's worthy to receive all our praise. He is worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy. He is worthy, oh, worthy is the Lamb. He is worthy and glorious and beautiful, all-powerful, lily of the valley, body, morning star. He is worthy. He is coming soon to receive his bride. Find me by his side. He is worthy of our glory of all power and all praise. Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's worthy of my praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. Come on, sing that with me. Help me. I said he's worthy. 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 Come on, flow in the flow in the prophetic. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. You believe it, sing it. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. We worship you, Lord. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. Every chain. Break every chain. Every chain. Break every chain. Come on, Sister Nita, sing it. Come on, give him a praise. If he set you free. Come on, give him a praise and lift your voice up and praise him. Come on, lift your voice up and give him a praise because he's blessed you today. Oh, come on, you can do better than that, Faith Assembly. Come on. Come on, give him a shout of victory because he's blessed you today. How many of you are glad you came to church this morning? More importantly, how many of you are glad that since you got here, he came too? I want to have some church when I get to church. It's not going to do Macomb, Mississippi any good if all the glory we got stays in here and never goes outside these walls and touches this city. Amen, somebody. We need the glory on the inside to get on the outside and touch our neighbors. Amen. I don't know, but I'm glad I came to church, and I'm glad he showed up. Hug somebody by the neck and tell them I'm glad we've got us. Tell them I'm glad our church is alive. Amen. Tell them I'm glad our church is alive. Uh, somebody can't get a little more excited than that. Come on. If you're glad you got a church that's alive, somebody ought to run. Somebody ought to shout. Somebody ought to... Do something if your church is alive. Hallelujah. Hey. What's up, Bulldog? Hallelujah. I love it when the Holy Ghost flows. 
I said, I love it when the Holy Ghost flows. I love it when the Holy Ghost flows. I got I to gotta write a song about that. <laughs> I love it when the Holy Ghost flows. <laughs> I'm, I'm bad about doing that. <laughs> Amen. Hug somebody by the neck. Tell them, I'm so glad I came uh, to church today to see you. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You can be seated for just a few minutes. It's, we're going to move into our offering and, uh, and our tithing, but let me make one quick announcement. We're not in a hurry. We only have one service today, so we're not in a big hurry today, but we don't want to uh, drag out the service either. We want to stay in tune with the move of the Spirit. But I heard yesterday, because we've got some dynamic ministries at Faith Assembly of God. We're proud of all of our ministries, men, women, children, youth, um, um, men, men. <laughs> That's the best one yet. And, uh, but, but yesterday, our young people had a scavenger hunt. And I just heard by, by way of grapevine, like I always do, is that Sister Mistress' team actually won yesterday. That's what I heard. Whose team really won? Whose team? Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to settle this once and forever on. I'm the judge, amen. Somebody from uh, uh, either team, any team, how many teams do you have yesterday, Brother T1? Three, you had three different teams. Somebody from every team, do we have somebody from every team? If, you're, if you were in a different team, you were in one team, were you in another team or the same team? Do I have anybody from uh, Misty's team here? Wait about me. Misty's team. How about Wendell's team? How about uh, Crystal's team? Okay. So I have three different teams. The first one up here and gives me ten jumping jacks is the winner of that, of, of, of that contest. First one up here, give me five jumping jacks. going to be the winner. They get to the, they get they get. One, two, three. They won. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. What team was she with? Then Brother Wendell's team won. Brother, team, Brother Wendell's team won. You say, Brother Ronnie, what was all that about? That's just all letting our young people know that we love them, we support them, and just something. Something just a little silly. So just overlook that. If that was just a little silly to you, just overlook that. We've got the word coming in just a few minutes. Amen. And we're excited about what God is doing. I'm, I'm thankful, see. I'm going to balance that silliness right there with the fact that 15 minutes ago, these kids came on their own without a preacher having to tell them. Under the, the anointing of the worship, they came on their own seeking the more of the presence of God. So y'all can say whatever you want to. It's not going to bother me one bit. You young people, you keep going after God. You older people, keep going after God. Amen. Let's all go together. Amen. In 1 Kings 17, there's a story of Elijah going down to the city of Zarephath. You know the story. And a widow is about to take care of him. She's down to her last meal. And the scripture teaches that she, uh, because of a famine uh, in the land, uh, she is about to get down to her meal for her and her son. And then after that last meal, they prepared to die. They prepared to die. They knew after this meal, because of the famine, this was all they were going to have to eat, and then they're going to die. She had lost hope, and now the, the preacher comes along and asks her for her last meal. That just sounds like an old greedy preacher, doesn't it? Well, Y'all can amen better than that because it's not talking about me. And in verse 9, you read God had already talked to this woman about taking care of Elijah before he ever got there. So on one hand, she's got her last meal. and the other hand, she has the commandment of God. And so there's a battle going on. And she knows God told her to take care of this man's ministry. Yet if they don't eat, it's their last meal. So Elijah said this, feed me first, because he knew God had commanded her to take care of him. So he's really, it's not his fault. He, he knows he's asking her to do something, you know, that wasn't right for her to do. He's just asking her to go ahead and obey God. He, he encouraged her to obey God. And when she did it, watch this, provision came into her life. And she was miraculously supplied for for over a year. 
And so when God asked her to do what she was supposed to do, he did it because he wanted to bless her. And he did bless her. And when God has commanded you to do something, it's not because he wants to take from you. He understands that he just wants to bless you. When you obey God, God wants to bless you. He just wants to know you're down to your last meal anyway. And you're preparing to die anyway. Give your last meal to God if God tells you to do it, and God will supernaturally provide for you. So what is God dealing with you about paying your tithe and giving in the offering? Has God said you need to become a tither? It's because God wants to bless you. If you're a tither, have you taken a faith pledge? Well, I don't know, preacher. It's tight already. Watch God bless you. Why is God dealing with your heart? Why is God asking you to do that? Is he trying to hurt you? No. He may be looking at you a little bit over here, but I want to command you to look at the, the commandment of God and follow through with that commandment, follow through with that instruction. And if you do, I'm telling you provision is going to come. I can't tell you how many times I got down to my last meal. Dana and I were down to just a conglomeration food. That's when you take a can of everything and put it in one big pot and eat what you've got. That's the conglomeration. And we've been there many times. But look at me. I hadn't missed a meal yet. That's okay. Brother Wendell's got me upstairs and Misty and the kids got me up there. I'm t 25 and it is wearing me out. This body had moved that, that fast and that much in 25 years. But if you'll obey God, God will bless you. Amen. Get your tithe ready. Get your offering ready. I'm going to speak our declaration over you. Amen. Be a tither. Grab a, a pledge. And if, you're, and if you're giving toward your faith pledge, please designate that church make over. Doesn't the sanctuary look good? Doesn't it look good? Amen. Father, as we bring in today's tithe and offerings and over and above giving, we are believing you this morning for a supernatural release of your favor over every area of our lives. Some of us need jobs and better jobs, checks in the mail, inheritances, secure investments, scholarships, creative ideas, finding money, healing for our spirit, soul, and body, deliverance to the captives, salvation to the lost, two more today, and an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We are blessed, and we will be a blessing to others in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. If you have your tithe and your offering ready, come on and, and put it in the plate and worship God through your giving. Amen. <laughs>
you believe it, praise the Lord. If you believe it, say amen. If you say it, say amen. Say it with a little soul, amen. 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 Sister Crystal, where you at, Sister Crystal? Sister Crystal, this is a fine young lady. She loves God, and we love her. She's going to come and bless us with a song this morning, and we are, we are excited that, uh, that these young people are singing for Jesus. Amen. I'd take Crystal over Katy Perry any day. I'd take Crystal over. I'd take Crystal. Children's Church, you are dismissed. I thought Shelly was finally flowing in the spirit for a minute. I saw her waving something. Hadn't seen that in five months yet. Amen. That's all right. That's okay. Amen. I love all young people, and I'm glad that they're singing for the kingdom of God. Amen.
Praise God. Good job, young lady. Amen. Uh, let, me, let me just mention very quickly before I introduce our guest speaker this morning. If, if you have been saved recently, even today, if you made a commitment and you want to and need to be, I, I promote and support water baptism, please see me after service. You've noticed in the, in the center section of your bulletin, if you, if you want to be baptized in water, let me know and so we can get this scheduled and we appreciate it so, so very much. Also, I want to say a big thank you to our youth pastor this week. He's hung with the old preacher and even led the old preacher many times over the last three weeks. I want to tell you something, this young man on the platform, I, I haven't seen but maybe one other, few other people that could match my passion for the house of God like this man does. And, and it gets us in trouble with our wives. <laughs> it, it, it doeth. <laughs> it surely doeth. Uh, because we're here trying to make sure that everything is prepared and looks presentable to you. So thank you for your patience. But if, if after the service, hug this young man's neck up here. And if the Lord leads, just stick something in his hand or his coat pocket. Not asking you to do that for me. But bless this man. Because his labor of love for this house uh, is, is tremendous. And I appreciate it. Well, all right. We've had a move of God. Now you're ready to be taught the word of God. Are you ready to be taught the Word of God? Amen. Brother David Maxwell from our district office in Jackson is no stranger to you, and I had the pleasure of meeting him uh, uh, when I first moved here, and he, he was in the area, stopped by and introduced ourselves to each other, and I, I asked him to come today, and we've been looking forward to this. Would you please give him a welcome to the faith pulpit? Amen. And let him know he's got 15 minutes. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, Faith. It is good to see you. It's been a while. Y'all changed a few things. I um, appreciate Pastor and, and what's happening here. Uh, as just someone, you know, sometimes when you're here week to week, you don't, and you may be new and you don't know, but, but I tell you, there's a sense of expectancy that I felt when I've walked in and I've had the whole time. There's a hunger that is happening that I, I just see it overflowing into this city. So let me just encourage you with that. Sometimes in the week to week you wonder, and sometimes some of you may be thinking, it's a black wall, I don't know. I, I don't, there's something happening here, people. God is doing something. There's just there's something strong going on, and uh, it's the anointing. And you know what? Macomb needs it. I passed a lot of churches, but I bet there's still a lot of unsaved people in this city. You may work with a couple. God wants to reach them, and he wants you to do it. So, so I encourage you, stay open. Be open to what he wants to do and how he wants to do it, because he's going to do it through you. Now, God could just appear and touch everybody, but he wants to use you. Amen. Amen. Well, I am David Maxwell. I am the... Uh, Mississippi Youth and Christian Education Director for Mississippi. And, and that's a lot of stuff. But what does that mean? It means that we are all about empowering the students, leaders, and missionaries from Mississippi. We want to empower them so they can impact the world for Jesus. We want to see them do incredible things, and that's what our office does. We do uh, events with students, with children. We do the camps. In fact, this summer we have a couple camps going on. We do our teen camp, which is called Collide Summer Camp, and it's happening this summer, uh, June 22nd through the 26th. Pat Schatz line will be coming to speak, and uh, we're excited about that. We're excited about what God is going to do. Our theme of camp this year is Remnant Rising because we believe this is a generation that's a remnant, and we're calling them to rise up. And then our kids camp is an incredible blast. We have... Um, hundreds of kids come from all over the state, and we do a kids' camp. And there, there's kids all over the place. And, and you know what's funny? That's not my natural thing. I was a youth pastor for 20 years before coming into office. And so kids, I have to work a little harder to be around kids. It's a little tougher for me. Some people, they're just natural kid people. It takes me a little bit. I love them, though, because you know what? When you can get a child going after God, they just believe God. 
I love kids because they just, well, why don't we just pray and let God heal you? Well, okay, let's do it. Uh, uh, children are incredible. So if your students, your teenagers, or your kids are looking for a summer experience, we encourage you, let them come to camp. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to touch their life, and it's going to change them. We just believe that. Well, today I want to talk about how it all started for me. It all started at a dentist office. Now, I don't know about you, but even when I was a little kid, when I went to the dentist office, I prayed. <laughs> I didn't even know God. I was a heathen, but I still prayed. <laughs> Dentists just do that to you. I think it's a great evangelistic calling. But, uh, you know, I, I would sit in the dentist office as a little child. My family didn't go to church, but they had these picture Bibles in the dentist office. I don't know if you've seen them. They're like the realistic pictures. And I would look through them. And, and I, as, I was, as I was flipping through them, I would see pictures of like Adam and Eve in the garden. But the one that always got me was Noah and the ark. Because you would see the ark and you'd see everything going on, but I'd see the people on the outside. And what I didn't know, because I was a little kid, was God was already calling out to me. Because that's our Father in heaven. And what he wanted to do was begin an adventure in my life. And so we're going to talk about today adventures and how our society loves adventures. So I got a little clip I want to show you. It's from, a, it's from a cartoon that I bet most of you have never seen. It's called Adventure Time. Okay? So just, I'm not going to explain it till after you watch it. You might lose a couple brain cells while you watch this intro. But watch this, and we're going to talk about Adventure Time today. Okay, did you lose a couple brain cells there? Okay, Adventure Time, what is it? I've only seen a couple of them. My kids showed it to me. It is complete randomness in a cartoon. The, the cartoon has no real purpose, okay? It's just kind of goofy. And, and don't knock it. Don't sit there if you're an adult going, we never watched stuff. Yes, we did. Gilligan's Island was as goofy as anything these kids ever watched. So don't even go there, okay? So, so, so it was complete randomness and goofiness. But you know what's funny is I love, I love the name Adventure Time. Because you know what? As a society, we love adventures, don't we? We do. We love adventures. We love movie adventures. What's happening with all the Marvel movies and all the superhero movies? I mean, New York City shouldn't even be around anymore because every movie you watch, it gets destroyed. It's like, well, New York's destroyed again. You know, it's just every movie destroys New York City. But then the next movie, it magically appears again. It's adventures. Video games are huge for people. Why? Because it's adventures. You know, people get into things that kind of take them out of themselves. Some people read books that are adventures. But you know what? Story adventures, movie adventures are very different from real life adventures, aren't they? They are. And it's, the thing that is, is God has put in us a desire for an adventure because our life with God is an adventure. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the adventure of life with God through one man. His name is Abram. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 12. Turn with me there. Genesis chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4. And this is what it says. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. This is when Abram's life began. And later his name was changed to Abraham. And he's the, the father of our faith in many ways. But when he started this adventure, he didn't know what was coming around in his life. He traveled all around that area. He experienced God in mighty ways. But he also experienced failures. He experienced victories. And he impacted the world. One man. This is when it all began for him. And in Abraham's life, we see some characteristics 
that I believe God wants each one of us to live out. Because sometimes you may think, you know, I'm in Macomb, Mississippi, the adventure. You know, you may not feel very adventurous when you drive around. Let's go eat at this restaurant or this one. Let's go back to this one. You know, and the, and the reality is, even in a city, if you have a city with hundreds of restaurants, usually you pick about four or five of your favorites. It's just the way it is. And how many of you, when you go to the same restaurant that's your favorite, you order the same thing? You know, people are like that. I found my favorite thing. This is what I eat. Leave me alone. You know, they don't try any new thing. But, but God wants us to live an adventure. So we're going to look at his life, and we're going to see how it affects our life and what we do. Amen? Are you with me this morning? Everybody here, you feeling good? Okay, did the cartoon scare you? Because did it turn you? I mean, some of y'all, I don't know. You may, may scare a little bit. But let's look at what's going on with Abraham's life and our adventure. So the first thing is adventures are to be lived. God intends for us to live the adventure. Verse 4 says, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. And you notice when Jesus called his disciples, what did he do? He said, follow me. When God called Abram, he said, let's go. And you know, that's all he said. He didn't tell him anything. He didn't promise much at all. He just said, come. And you know, that's what God does for us. Some of us don't like that. Some of us tend to be a little OCD, and we want to know where are we going, how are we doing it, what's the time frame, what's the agenda. God doesn't give agendas. He is the agenda. And he wants us to live our life the way he says. And he usually just says, let's start. And you think, well, I don't know anything else, God. And he goes, it's okay. You know me. That's all you need to know. So that's what he did. He called Abraham. We are called to come do life with him. You know that's the number one thing you have to do for God is just do life with him, is experience him and have a relationship with him. That's the first and foremost thing you do. We live life. We experience life. The danger today is I think we tend to want to capture life. Have you ever seen a video of like a concert or an event and everybody has their phones out? They're trying to get a picture. Have you ever taken a picture of something that's way far away? What does it look like? Something that's way far away. You know, what is that? No, it was the greatest. It was when he made the touchdown catch. I, I don't see, I see little ants, you know, and, and it's just, it's crazy. And it's funny because today, you know, uh, older generations will make fun of, well, they are always got their phones out. they always got their phones out. No, 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 no. It's happening all over. We were at a, a thing recently. It was a symphony, and it was a tribute to Motown, okay, which Motown music, a lot of people grew up with that music. And when, when the guy went to sing out in the audience to everybody, what did all the grandmas and grandpas do? They had their phones out. They were videoing. I thought I was looking at a group of teenagers at a concert. I mean, they were, woo, you know, and it's someone's grandma. You know, and it's just, it's funny because they were, they were wanting to capture life. And sometimes we tend to want to capture life and not really live it. We want to capture a peace and not experience all that God has for us. And God has called us to live life. Hebrews 11.8, it says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. The point of the adventure with God is that we're with God. It's with him. Do you ever have friends you just like being around? It doesn't matter what you do. When you grew up, did you have like that best friend that y'all could just look at each other and you know what the other one's thinking? It's just the way it is. Have you ever been around people who've been married a long time? It's almost scary. They say the same jokes. They, they know exactly what the other one wants. You know, you'll, you'll see one sitting there making a cup of coffee, and there's two cups, and you're like, are you thirsty? No, this is, this is for my husband. He, he's, where is he? He'll be here in just a minute. And all of a sudden, he walks in, and you're like, that's creepy. That's kind of weird. My wife and I will go up to someone, and we will talk to them. We'll ask them the exact same questions. It's weird, but it just happens. 
You see, the point of life with God is that you're with God. The point of life with God is not to get a check mark. It's not to wear a t-shirt that say, I serve Jesus. It's just the fact you get to serve Jesus. It's that you have a relationship with him. And that's what people want to see in you. They want to see, is it real? They don't want to see just a church and religion. They want to see people who walk with Jesus. And that's what we do, and that's what Abram did. In, in verse 7 of chapter 12, he built an altar. Verse 8, he built an altar. That's what he did. The point of living the adventure with God is that you're with God. Now, the danger is if God promises you something and you try to make it come about yourself instead of just living with him and trusting him. You see, Abraham did that. He had some problems with that. You see, God promised him, you're going to have a child. And it was many, many, many years later. And he had an idea. Hey, or actually it's his wife's idea. It's a weird idea. But they thought maybe this is it. And you know, we're still paying the consequences today from that decision. You see, the point is not for you to make things happen in your life. The point is for you to make sure you're in relationship. You know, you don't have to fix everything in the world. You don't have to fix the world. You just have to spend time with God, and God will tell you what you need to do next. Some of us don't like that because we like to be our own gods. We like to earn God. Do you know why there's so many false religions around the world? Because each one of them has you earn your way to God. In Islam, you earn your way to Allah. But then if Allah doesn't like you for whatever reason, you don't get to go. In, in Buddhism, you have to earn your way. Hinduism, you're working your way through up, through reincarnation. It's all of these things to earn God. Have you ever seen that the prayer wheels, they spin, and, and they believe those are prayers going up for them. Because they're earning their way to God. And sometimes we in the church, we think that way. I've got to earn, well, I've got to read my Bible today or God's going to get me. No, no, you get to read your Bible. You get to spend time with the infinite creator of the universe. It's something exciting. Adventures are meant to be lived. And we have to be careful because we kind of start thinking we can do it ourselves. And Proverbs says something about that. 14, 12, it says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. You may think, well, this feels right. We can't trust our feelings. The Bible says that. It says the heart is desperately wicked. I hate those people that say, you just need to follow your heart. <laughs> no, you don't. Because your heart's dumb. The Bible says it. You talk to two people, you'll get two different stories, won't you? Why? Because all of us tell it from our point of view. You ever had, if you had kids and they come home from school, that teacher hates me. That teacher hates me. And what's bad is today a lot of parents are believing them. They do. They hate you. I'm going to kill them. You know? And you're just like, every kid says that. Every kid believes the teacher hates them. No, but they really do hate my child. Well, maybe we do too. But anyway, you know, it's just one of those things. You've got to understand that we, we can't earn God. Now, you may think God is slow. Have you ever felt that? You know why? Because time means nothing to God. When you're infinite, you have all the time in the world. Time is a, is a created thing. It's invented. We, we, we are seeing what God made for us but he is above and beyond time. There is no time to him. Do you know why the Bible says he's the beginning and the end? Because he's already there. He, he's already there with you a thousand years from now. To him, there is no such thing as time. He transcends time. And that's who we get to be with. Isn't that incredible? So when God says, I'm going to fulfill a promise, you just say, do it. Now, we want it quick. We want a microwave. We want, you know, three steps. You know, first of the year, what happens? You get all the weight loss commercials. <laughs> Take this one pill, and the fat will fall off your body instantly, which is kind of creepy. But you know what, people? I'm going to get that pill. 
That is good stuff. I'm going to, because we want things fast. We don't want to work for it. But God wants us to live that life. And when we do that, we'll see the adventure. Because the adventure is with him. The second thing, adventures are unexpected. Adventures don't feel adventurous when you're living it. I don't know if you've noticed that. You know, as, as we tend to get older, we tend to tell stories of the past, and there's a little bit more glory on them than when we were living them, don't you think? You know, when you ever talk to some guys who played football back in the day? Oh, when we played football, coaches never gave us water. In fact, the coaches would kick us all the time and throw rocks at us when we play. You know, and you're just like, you'd be dead. You know, and it just, the story gets bigger and bigger. You know, and, and we all tend to do that. We tend to kind of embellish a little bit. You know, I was a good football player. Ten years later, I was a great football player. Another ten years later, I was all state. I was recruited by Bear Bryant himself. You know, it just, it kind of tends to grow and grow as we live. But adventures aren't really like that. You see, Abraham followed God. God said, I want you to go. Abraham got all his people and he went. And guess what happened? He went to Canaan. (laughs) There was a famine. You ever obeyed God and it didn't go quite like you thought? God, are you telling me to do this? And he is. And then you do it and it's not fun. You see, sometimes we think serving God means everything goes well. If you think that, you might want to read the Bible a little more. It doesn't always go well. In fact, a lot of times when you start serving God, things get rough. Why? Because the enemy gets scared of you. And he starts noticing you, and he says, oh, no, 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 no. We got to keep them quiet and calm, so let's send them some adversity. Because he knows if you learn to overcome, you're a threat to his kingdom. And too many of us in the church are willing to not be a threat because we don't want any trouble. Well, I don't want to do anything. I don't want the enemy attacking me. But that's just it. It's all fake. It's like a little child coming up to you and saying, I can take you. You're a little, you're, or a cockroach even. (laughs) You ever had a cockroach? I'll take you. That's it. You win. We have Jesus in us. Satan can't do a thing to you unless you let him. You've got the almighty, powerful one of the universe in you. That's what you're to live out. But it doesn't mean life is always easy. It doesn't mean everything's always going to go your way. Life is unexpected. Abraham got to Canaan. There was a famine. So what did he do? Instead of trusting God and staying, he went down to Egypt. It was not a good trip for him because he picked up a habit of lying. And it it really got him into trouble. But then what did he do? He went back to Canaan, went back to Bethel. He built an altar in chapter 13, verse 4, to the Lord. And you know what that shows? That our life, sometimes if we get off track a little bit, we just go back and repent. Repentance is not a one-time thing. We think, well, I repented 20 years ago, Pastor Dave. I'm good. That was just the beginning. If you drive, you need to repent. I've seen the way you drive. I drive in Jackson, Mississippi. I have to repent all the time. Not for how I drive, but for how I think about the other people when they drive. Kill you. If I had a James Bond car, it wouldn't be pretty. I'd be shooting missiles all over Jackson, Mississippi. Three cars exploded today. Nobody knows why. And you'd see a white van with church bus on the back, and I'd be going... You know, it just, it'd be happening. It's not very spiritual. And you know what? There are days you may not be that spiritual. And you know what you do? You repent. But the enemy fools us because he has this thinking, oh, you messed up. God won't take you back. So we walk away. We walk away. And God says, no, come back. I've got a Bethel for you. Come build an altar to me. You see, adventures with God are filled with exciting moments and then ultimately boring moments. I was talking with my my wife's grandpa. He's 96 years old. 
He's an incredible man. Can't hear a thing. It's incredible. <laughs> you have to yell. <laughs> Hello, you know. But, but he was a World War II vet and was shot down. And he's never really talked about it until recently he started talking about it. So we're trying to record it. We're trying to get him talk. So I pulled out Google Maps, and he showed me. It was, it was incredible. He showed me where he was shot down. He showed me the cities. We went into Germany to the different cities they took him to. And he talked about how they, they couldn't escape because it was snowy, and they, they, well, they wouldn't give them anything but a pair of socks to wear. And there was almost no guards because they, it was like, well, you can run away if you want. You'll die. You'll freeze to death. So that, that's how they, they kept him in. Then they took him to a little peninsula in northern Germany. And he showed me where it was. It was incredible. But he talked about how it was one of the scariest things and then one of the most boring things. Because then you're just there. And you just sit around day after day after day. He was there for almost two years. And you see, sometimes we think an adventurous life means every day is exciting. It's not. But it's what you do during that daily grind that makes all the difference. Something happened later in Abraham's life, Genesis 14, 14. Sodom had just been taken a lot, and his family had been kidnapped. And in Genesis 14, 14, it says, When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. You know, the, the interesting thing of that is that Abraham had trained already 318 men. You know what that means? That means during the boring, monotonous time of life, Abraham said, we need to be training. We need to be prepared. We need to be getting ready. He didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know Lot was going to be kidnapped. But he was taking care of business during the boring, slow time. Here's the deal, church. For us, if we're not prepared, God can't send us what he wants. You see, right now, you're excited. God is doing some good things here. But you know what? I look out. I see a lot of people on Sunday morning who aren't in church. God wants to reach them. What are we doing to reach them? What are we doing to prepare? If God all of a sudden sent 200 more people to this church, next Sunday, would you be ready? You know, a lot of us, ooh, 200, where would they sit? Exactly. Exactly. But you see, God wants us to begin during this time of, okay, we're not there, but what do we do to prepare for that? Abram was preparing his men, and he took 318 and went after an army and beat them up and took back Lot and all the stuff. 318 men. Rambo had nothing on Abram's men. They were incredible. You know why? Because during the slow time, they were prepared. Do you know why you're to, to pray and read your Bible and study your Bible? And you do it in days when you don't feel like it? You ever had those days you fall asleep praying? I have. I try not to do it when I'm driving. It's kind of scary. But if you, you, if you haven't done it, then you're not doing it regular enough. Some days you've got to trudge through it. You ever read through the Bible in a year? You get to Leviticus? <laughs> Lord, please help me get through this book. It's a tough book sometimes. But it's important because if you don't understand Leviticus, you don't really get all that Jesus' sacrifice did. So you need to know it, but that doesn't mean it's an easy read. There are times in life where serving God isn't easy. And you take it one day at a time, and you don't feel a thing. And that's okay. Because it's not called feeling, it's called faith. Amen? Amen? You see, faith has nothing to do with feeling. I love feeling God. I love the altar. I love coming up and, and sensing God's presence. But you know what? If you still treat people mean at Walmart, I don't care what you do at the altar. You're mean. If you're, if you're lying to coworkers, I don't care if you shake, fall down, and say God's all over you. He's not because you're not different out there. God wants us to be different. And you think, well, that's kind of harsh. 
Welcome to the South where everybody goes to church. But how many really serve Jesus? And you see, hypocrisy is eating away the church in the South. Well, I'm a Christian. Really? And I'm not saying you think, well, I don't know what I think about the way people act at the altar. It, it, it doesn't matter to you. What are you doing with God? How are you serving God? What are you doing to reach your neighbors? What are you doing to reach your coworkers? God wants you to live the adventure. You say, well, I don't know if I feel God. I don't care if you feel God. He's still God. Do you not feel gravity? Jump off a roof and see what happens. I don't feel gravity. I think I can fly today. Try it. See what happens. God, we, we get so, and, and, and I love the Holy Spirit. I love him moving. I love him touching people. But sometimes if we don't feel something, we think God's not there. When the Bible tells us God is omnipresent, he's always here. What we feel is we're just getting in tune with him. But sometimes he wants to see if you'll serve him when you don't feel him. If you've ever tried to exercise, if you ever tried to run a race, you look at people who train and you're like, they're weird. Who can get up and go run? I was training for a, a triathlon um, a few years ago, and it was, a, it was a long one, and the training was just brutal. And you know what? I, I hardly ever felt like training. I never woke up while it's dark and think, I get to go run. It's 40 degrees. Woohoo! I hated it. But when I got done, I was glad I did it. When I was on race day, I was really glad I did it. But you see, sometimes serving God, we think, if we don't feel it, it's not real. But we have to use our time wisely. That's what Abraham did with the men. They used their time wisely. I was reading the other day and came across an article, and it talked about how to survive a plane crash. Kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? How do you survive a plane crash? Uh, you don't. Uh, you know. You know, you just, you don't, you don't see survival unless you have a parachute. Actually, the majority of the time, the people who die in plane crashes, it's not when the plane hits. Because a pilot, most pilots can land a plane just about anywhere if it's flat. It may not be a soft, sweet landing, but if you make it on the ground, that's a landing. If your engines are gone and your pilot lands you and you're alive, don't get mad at him. Tip them on the way out. But here's the deal. The reality is most people who die in a plane crash, it's not when the landing happens. It's when they don't get out of the plane fast enough. When a plane crashes, when it has to come down in an emergency situation like that, a lot of times something is wrong. And, and, and jet fuel is very volatile. And they say you usually have about 90 seconds to get out before something happens. The plane blows up, flames take over, things like that. What happens is people land, and they're like, Whew, we made it, and they don't get out. They don't rush to get off the plane. And the reality is you have about 90 seconds to get off that plane, on average, before something goes wrong. You see, and in our life sometimes, when things aren't happening, we think, I'm just going to kick back. But that's your time to train. That's your time to pull in closer to God. If you're not feeling God, then that's your time to say, you know what, I'm going to go to the altar even though I don't feel a thing. I'm going to hit the altar even though no one around me is touching me. I, don't, I want God. I want God now, and I want him more. And people say, well, do you feel God? Nope, not today. Did God touch you? God did by faith. I didn't feel a thing, but you know what? I'm believing that he's changing me. You see, and the problem is, if we go feeling-based, then our faith is based on our feelings. And your feelings come and go, don't they? How many of you wake up on Monday? Woohoo! Work! Do you enjoy that? When you went to school, did you wake up every day? I got school today. Yes! Three tests. Woohoo! When you pay bills, do you enjoy that? Here's more of my money. There are certain things we just don't feel, we just do. And that's the way it is with God. 
God wants us to live through the unexpected. And they will come, but God is with you in them. The last thing, adventures are not based on us. We are called to live the adventure, not be the adventure. Have you noticed we have a strange society today? We have a fascination with famous people. People have had whole careers based on nothing else but being famous. That's all it is. But we eat it up as a society. I think it's a form of idolatry. I, but I'm, I'm not going to get into all that. That's not the point. But, but the adventure, sometimes we think serving God is all about me. And you know what? It's not. Genesis 12, 1, the Lord said to Abram, What's important with that verse is who started the adventure. God did. Abram was just sitting around. He was just sitting around, minding his own business, serving false gods, and God spoke to him. You see, the adventure that you live for God starts with God, not you. You see, here's the fact. Jesus came to reach us. We didn't go to him. Jesus came to you. Because the Bible says we were lost. Have you ever been truly lost? You ever been following your GPS and it lies to you? (laughs) Okay, there's the movie theater. It's a barn. That happened to me one time. It lied. It lied. I don't know where I am. There are so many people, they're living life, and they're going the complete wrong direction, and they don't know it. It's called lost. We were all lost, but Jesus took the initiative and came to reach us. The adventure is not about you. It's about him. It's about what he's done for us. The story of Abraham is not to show off Abraham as the father of our faith. The story of Abraham is to show off a God who looked at a man named Abram and changed his life. You see, and God wants to do that. He wants to look at you and change your life. He wants to use you to touch the world. You think, well, I'm retired, Pastor Dave. What can I do? You can touch the world. How do I do that? Living the adventure. When you live God's adventure, you will touch touch the world. Because God is still working today. God pursues you. He goes after you. Have you ever seen a young couple in love? Do you remember when you were a young couple in love? You pursued each other. You wrote goofy notes to each other. At least I hope you did. If you didn't have some goofiness, come on now. You would spend time together. When I was a kid and you'd get, you know, you'd get into a relationship, a girlfriend, and we'd just sit on the phone. This was back when phones were connected to the wall. And, and you had the, when you got the long cord, you were happy because then you could, like, you know, cook and, and eat and you do all that. And you just sit on the phone. You don't talk. You don't say anything. You're just on the phone. Every once in a while, you kind of grunt, hey, you know. And that's just because you just wanted to be together. You see, the reality is God wants to be with you. But too often we think we have to earn God's acceptance. I have two kids. One is 19. He's in college out in uh, Texas at Sagu. Um, And my daughter's still in high school. I love my kids. I would take bullets for my kids. You know, my children have never walked into the house and looked at me and ran away the other direction, going, I'm not worthy of you, Dad. You can't be my dad and run away. They've never done that. Usually they come up to me, hey, Dad, I need some money. You know, I mean, they they know you're the dad, I'm the kid, you're supposed to provide. Isn't it funny that God calls himself our father? And yet we don't want to trust him to provide for us. 
well, God, I would tithe, but I need this money because I know more than you do. And God's like, really? What universe have you created lately? I build Legos, you know, and, and, and that's what we, we think. But, but, but the reality is my children don't have to earn the right of being my children. I gave them that. So I don't sit back and go, you're not my son. Because he is my son. But too often in the church, we're trying to earn God. So we're so busy trying to earn God for ourselves, we're not focused on other people. We see God as being there only for me. I'm coming to church for me. I want something from God. I need something from God. So what happens is our faith becomes very me-based, and there's a lost world that needs Jesus. You see, I want to encourage you to come to church not thinking of you, but looking at the other people. Who am I going to bless today at church? Who am I going to let sit in my seat? Mm, yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting in your business now. That's my seat. What are you doing in my seat? That's where I always sit. But imagine if everybody came to church wanting to bless someone else. What if on a Sunday you come trying to out-bless the other person? I prayed for you five times this week. I prayed for you six. Mm. Who won? Hey, new person, I got them first. I got them in the parking lot. I already know their name. That's Jimmy and Mary. You think, why should we do that? Because you'd be the friendliest place in town. People like friendly people. But sometimes in the church, we, we hold back. You know, I, I just need something from God today. But when you give, God looks at you and says, oh, that's good. I'm going to bless them. You know why? Because they got my heart. God's a giver. He wants you to be a giver. He wants you to reach out to people. He wants you to touch people. And when you do, you connect with God. And he says, I'm going to bless them because they have my heart. This last summer, we had a girl at camp. She was an intern. And I have an intern program at camp. And it's, we tell the, the kids, some are high schoolers and college age, and we tell them, we're going to work you like dogs, and you'll get no sleep all week. And they love it. I don't understand. It's great. But we had this one girl, she's interned the last couple of years, never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, prayed every summer at camp. And it always breaks my heart because it's like I, I just don't, I don't understand why that happens sometimes. It just does. Well, this last summer, it was not, we were praying for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We had, we had almost uh, 100 people at summer camp this summer baptized in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. For those of you who don't know, the Holy Spirit is for today. God wants us to, to use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to use us. It's not a scary, spooky, voodoo-y thing, okay? When you understand what the Bible really says, it's not some strange thing that only for the weird people. It's for all of us. But anyway, that's, again, another message. I'll do that one other time. So, so what happened was, little girl's at the altar. She's about 16 years old, praying for her friend to receive the baptism. She would never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit praying for someone else, and guess what God did? She's sitting there praying. All of a sudden, she started praying in a heavenly language. And it's funny because she's a real shy person. Real, so, you know, she didn't fall out and scream and run around. She just came up crying, tears. You're not going to believe what happened. And then I had crying, tears. You see, when you give, when you're, when you're looking for others, when it's not about you but it's about God, God will use you. God will do incredible things through you. And Abraham wasn't perfect. I told you he had a lying habit. He did it a couple times. And, and to me, the interesting part is one time he did it when his wife was 90 years old. And she was so good looking, he was afraid people were going to steal her. Did you not get that? 90 years old. He had to lie because he was afraid people were going to steal his wife. That's a good-looking woman. 90 years old, and Abraham's, uh-uh, they're going to steal you. They're going to steal you, baby. I wish I had a picture of her. 
Because, you know, most of us, you know, we hit 90. I'm not thinking I'm going to be a good-looking guy. I'm thinking kind of a prune, you know, just kind of walking. You know, I, I, I just, I don't see that. But Abraham had, to, he lied about her. He had a bad habit. You know why the Bible tells us about people like that? Because God wants to show us, I love you despite sometimes your goofiness and your stupidness. We'll do dumb things. But God says, I still have a call in your life. Because it's not about you. It's about him. Your life is about God. What you do is about him. How you earn money or whatever, God will lead you and direct you in that. But the whole time, your life is about serving him. And once you get that, it takes all the pressure off. You're not trying to earn other people's favor because you got the, the Lord of the universe who loves you. You know, people, I'm going to make fun of you because you're a Christian. <laughs> okay. The guy who made everything loves me. That's all I need. Well, we're going to fire you because you're a believer. Okay. The guy who made everything, who owns everything, I'm his kid. He's going to take care of me. You see, it's not about you. And once you get that, once you understand that your mistakes don't stop God's plan, you may have made some mistakes. They may be horrible. And a lot of times we'll, we'll pull ourselves off of doing anything for Jesus. Well, you know, Pastor Dave, when I, was, when I was this age, I did some dumb stuff. Well, guess what? So did Abraham. You ever read the life of David? A man after God's own heart. Murder, adultery. That's pretty bad. You see, God will still use you. Why? It's not about you. It's never been about you. It's about him. That's the adventure he wants you to live. So what is adventure time? What is it for us? For us, it's to go live the unexpected life that is not based on us. To wake up every day saying, God, I want your adventure. God, I want to I wanna be the person you want me to be. No one can do it for you. You say, well... My husband doesn't serve God. My wife doesn't serve God. It doesn't matter. You can serve God. My parents don't serve God. You can serve God. You can live that adventure every day. I'm not saying it's always going to be fun, but it's better than the alternative. Because imagine getting all the stuff in the world and then realizing you don't have life. You see, God wants us to have an adventure, to live it out. So what's my challenge as we close? To stop. To stop making excuses. To stop focusing on the things that are important. And to say, God, what do you want to do with my life? You think, well, well Pastor Dave, I don't, I don't do anything. You do. I don't come in contact with people to touch. You do. They may live next door to you. They may work next to you. They may be in the desk next to you. Wherever you are, there's people God wants you to reach. It could be something as simple as God telling you, I want you to love on babies at your church. Well, I did my time in the nursery. What is it, jail? You know, I did my time. Would you get out on parole, you know, for good behavior? There's no retirement in God's plan. God wants us to serve. And God calls us to serve. And what we have to do is say, God, where do you want me? What do you want me to do? And when you do that, you'll be living the adventure. I want us to bow our heads real quick. As I was praying over this message, I, I, I felt God wanted to do a, a few things in our life. I got a strong sense that some of you are feeling the, the reality. You're thinking that, that the adventure has passed you by. You're thinking the adventure has, has gone away from you. 
And, and you, you kind of, it, it may be because of your own actions. It may be because of your age. It may be because you think, I make too many mistakes. Whatever it is, you've kind of pulled back. And you're just kind of coasting. Well, I'm here this morning to let you know that God still believes in you. God still believes in your ability to touch and change people. And God will use you if you will let him. Don't believe the lie. Don't buy what the enemy is trying to give you. God has more. God has more for you. And I believe this morning God right now is speaking some specific things into your life. In fact, let's do this. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. And I want us just to, to take a moment. I want you to stand, and I want you to just close your eyes right now. And I just want you to kind of get into a posture of hearing from God. Because I believe God has some specific things. Maybe he's been speaking to you, and he's going to confirm it now, or he's going to begin speaking to you some new things. There's some ministries that God has been calling you to fill, to work, maybe here in the church. Maybe that preparing for the people is you joining and serving in a ministry to bless those who come. But God wants to speak to you this morning, and I want us to be willing to listen. So I want to take, just take some moment. It's going to be quiet, but you know what? It's good to learn how to sit still before the Lord. So let's just take about the next 30 seconds, and let's just let God speak to us this morning. Are you willing to do what God tells you to do? Are you willing to live the adventure? For some of you, it may be some chains that we talked about earlier. You need to lay those down. For some of you, God told you it's time to go get help. Some of you have been struggling with things, dealing with it, and you keep trying to beat it yourself, but you can't. And God is speaking to you this morning to get some help, to go to someone. Some of you, there's a ministry God wants you to be involved in. You've been resisting. Some of you, there's a neighbor you need to reach out to. Some of you, it's that you need to really start that relationship with Jesus. Life's an adventure. It's an adventure for you to live. Don't let it pass you by. You don't have to be perfect. Abraham showed us that. You just have to be willing. This morning, are you willing? Are you willing to let God move in you? Are you willing to let God touch you? That's where we have to be. That's what we, that's what we desire. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to take a few moments to pray, and I want us to, to make a prayer of dedication to the Lord. I believe God spoke to some of you about specific things. I believe God spoke to some of you. It may be something small. It may be something that nobody knows about. Some of you, dads, God called you to be the spiritual leader of your home today. God called you to begin to lead the prayers. God called you to begin praying with your children. Today's the day. If God spoke to you, what I want to do is I want us to take a few moments and I want us to pray with you. And I want you to dedicate yourself to the Lord this morning. So what I want us to do is I want us to just take a couple minutes. God spoke to you. Whatever he spoke to you, I want you in just a minute, I want you to come on up. And I want you to find a place at the altar, and I want you to lay it out before God. It could be reaching someone in your school. It could be reaching someone in your office. It could be going and apologizing to someone that you mouthed off to this morning. Whatever it is, this is the place to leave it. Abraham went back and built Bethel. It's time for us to go back to the altar of God. Amen? Amen. So what we're going to do, I'm going to have musicians, y'all can come on up. And what we're going to do is we're going to let some music play.
and just let a spirit of worship come. And I want you to come and I want you to begin to lay some of those things at the altar. It may be something small. It may be something big. But now is the time for you to come and lay it at the altar. Amen? Amen. That's what I want us to do right now. God spoke to you something. I want you to come and find a place at the altar. And I want you to come do it. Don't wait for someone else. Don't wait to see if anyone else is going. You come. You find your place. And you let God work through you right now. Amen. Just come on. Come on up. Find a place. God spoke to you. God spoke to you. Come and lay it at the altar right now. Come and find your place at the altar, and let's lay it out before God right now. We can get some ladies to come pray. Anyone else you want to find a place this morning, just come. Come on up. Come on up. Hallelujah. We don't have to have music to do this. We don't have to have music. Come and let's find a place, and let's worship, and let's lift God up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come find a place. Hallelujah. Let's hunger and thirst for more of God. Let's hunger and thirst in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Would you just lift your hand toward heaven and everyone? Come on, let's just begin to let God speak to those at the altar. We've got four down at the altar, and let's just let the Lord speak to their heart. Let's just worship for just a few moments. We'll be leaving in just a few minutes. Father, we love you. We're so thankful for this word. We know that life is an adventure, and sometimes life just doesn't go to according to our plans. But, Father, if our plans are tied into your plan, your plans actually become ours. Our life is to be there for you. And this morning, I want you to speak to these young people, these precious individuals at the altar. Speak to them, Father. Get them back into a, a place of commitment and servanthood where they're serving you every day of their lives. For those that maybe didn't make it to the front, those that maybe you're here and, and you want to respond and you just you just can't today. You just don't have the nerve. You're, you're afraid of what people might say or think of you. Listen. Don't worry about people. Worry about what the Lord has for you. You don't have to be in fear or in fear of being judged. We love you. God loves you just the way that you are. And we know that sometimes life brings disappointments. Life is full of pain and obstacles. But our God is able to help you overcome every obstacle. Our God is able to help see you through every trial, every fiery furnace. God's right there with you. No matter what you're experiencing today, disappointment, he can give you joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. Say, but pastor, you don't understand my life. I don't have to. God does. And if you'll just begin to live for God, sell out one more time, get committed, get connected, you'll see that all of this isn't for show. We just love to show God how much we love what he's done in our lives. Hallelujah. I'm going to lift your hand. Turn. Your eyes on Jesus. If you'll just look unto him. Cast all your care on him. For he cares for you. You'll be surprised at how different life will look when you leave today. As we tarry there. Hallelujah. And in We're going to sing it one time. Would you just lift your voice with us? Turn your eyes. Turn upon Jesus. Look to him. Look to him.
the joys of earth yeah. will go straight to Many of you love being in the presence of the Lord today. God, it was a good day in the house of God. Thank you, Lord. need the ushers to come very quickly very quickly we were we were planning to receive communion but I just feel like that next Sunday we'll, we'll partake of communion together it's late in the hour we've received freely from the Spirit of the Lord we want you to get an offering ready for our guest speaker we usually give them an honorarium but we also receive an offering for our guest speaker and we want you to do your very best. We want you to, to share what you have and to let Brother David Maxwell know. How many of you enjoyed that word today? The good word. It's what God had for us today. It's what God has for us today. And I love, I love everything my wife ever cooks, what she puts on the table. I love it. Other than greens and spinach and cabbage. Anything else other than that, it's all right. But I love everything else she puts on the table. And Brother David brought us the Word of God. How many of you going to live for God this week? Amen. Do your very best. Get an offering ready and let's receive an offering. We don't have our baskets. Here they come. Just put it in this, in this first one. Do your very best. Father, we're thankful for this Word. We want to bless the man of God. I know we've given and, and money's tight, but Father, I promise this body of believers, your word is accurate. Your word will never fade. That we cannot outgive you. And as they give again, will you bless them supernaturally? Press it down, shake it together, cause it to run over God in their lives. And I give you praise and glory in the wonderful name of Jesus. Bring an offering, then hug somebody by the neck and Consider yourself dismissed. We love you. Hug Brother David as you as you come by and, and, and say goodbye to him. Hug